really, really appreciate you for being here to the bitter end. <laughs> um, thank you so much for coming to our session on best practices in collecting and reporting demographic data. Um, I'm Maggie simmons -Kilo. I'm an associate professor at HMS. I do emergency medicine, teach emergency medicine, and social care research. And I'm going to let my friends and colleagues introduce themselves. Otherwise, I'm going to say it for you. So. <laughs> So now we've covered introduction. We're going to talk about demographic data and implications of inaccurate research. Why is it important for us to get this right? We're going to talk about variation in federal and state data collection and the impacts it has on your research and your operational work on quality improvement. We'll tell you about best practices for data collection and reporting and where there are gaps in the data to help support those best practices. And then at the end, we'll leave some time for audience discussion, questions, and answers. And we'd love to hear from you. If you have questions as we're talking, it's a relatively small group. Please feel free to raise your hand. We can interrupt at any point. Um, we're a relatively flexible bunch. So you know, as academics, that data are essential to identify disparities, but also to set priorities and to measure our progress. And if we're going to think about generating data with an equity focus, we really need to make sure that our data are accurate and that they're reliable, but also that they affirm our patients' identities and experiences and that we're putting people in categories that are relevant and salient to them. And so there's a lot of bad downstream events that happen if we get this wrong. Populations remain invisible and uncounted, and we're unable to address disparities that truly exist. So one example of this is that about a third of Americans have identities that don't match the standard census question about race and ethnicity. And those folks are hard to measure, hard to count, hard to assess disparities that might impact them. The other problem is that data is not accurate, and then our equity interventions either don't occur or are mistargeted. And so when people have looked at this within large healthcare systems like the VA, looking at how well our administrative data matches folks' self-report, they see agreement rates ranging from 16 to 60 percent. And that suggests that these data are undercounting racial and ethnic disparities and making it hard for us to target appropriate populations for intervention. And finally, when we think about how hospitals are collecting these data, currently about 50% are reporting practices that are not consistent with best practices in reporting and are basically just having some admitting clerk or registrar look at the patient and assign a race or ethnicity to them. So I'm just going to tell you about how to come study the Perfect. So continuing on that thread, um, a lot of what I'm going to show you is from the National Academy of Science. They put out a great um, report in the last couple of years with best practices for sex and gender and sexual orientation, um, actually, data collection, though we're not going to talk that much about sexual orientation. But these are sort of the principles that they talk about, and I think it's important for us to just go over these and think about that this should be at the core of every project you're designing when you're thinking about what to include. So first is the idea of inclusiveness, and that just means that people deserve to count and people deserve to be counted, right? Like we don't want anyone to be invisible. We want to use precise language. So some of the examples that Maggie was showing, like it, 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 this is a place where it's very important that we use language that you know patients relate to, um, how they self-identify, autonomy. We want to preserve individuality and autonomy. Um, <clears throat> and then the idea of parsimony. I'm sure you guys are familiar with trauma-informed care. This is sort of one of those principles. Like, you only collect what you need, right? Remembering that some of these are still stigmatized identities. So if I'm doing a project about sex differences in physiology, I am absolutely not going to ask about sexual orientation because that has nothing to do with what I'm studying, right? So you just collect what you need. And then the principle of privacy, super important. Um, again, with the idea of stigmatized identities, 
patients, we have to recognize that sometimes they're not going to be comfortable disclosing information um, and that protecting their privacy is of the utmost importance for us as researchers. Let's see, here we go. So just a couple of examples to show you sort of why this is important. And this is a paper looking at mortality trends for transgender patients. A couple things I want to point out and then I'll walk you through the figure. This is from 2021, okay? So this is super duper recent that this data is available. And also, this data is not from the United States. This is, this is um, a Dutch study because they had the data. So it's really hard for us to get this data. But turns out, so what they did is they linked up records from essentially a gender clinic and looked at patients who were on um, gender-affirming hormone therapy with their national, like their country's mortality database. Um, and compared mortality for trans patients compared to cis patients. And you all can see these are both Kappa Meyer curves. So trans women died sooner than cis <coughs> men or women. And the same was true for trans men. So they had a twofold increase in mortality. It didn't change over time. As you see, everybody's mortality went down, um, but it was kind of proportional. And interestingly, in this study, that was not due to hormones, okay? So we think this is in large part a disparity, not due to some kind of uh, physiologic difference. But if they hadn't had this data, those patients would be lost, right? We wouldn't know um, about this health disparity that needs to be addressed. Another example here, this is United States data, but again, I'll point out that this is from an administrative database. This is a claims database. So this is looking at differences in mortality among trans patients and also looking at race. So getting at the idea of intersectionality here and you can see in this Kaplan-Meier curve that both race and gender identity had a significant impact on mortality, right? So trans, black trans women and white trans women died sooner than black and white trans men, which is really interesting. Um, so this is why we study this sort of stuff. So I'm sure that you all probably know I sort of specifically study sex and gender, but there is um, a sex and gender minority office through the NIH, and this, these populations, sexual and gender minorities, were actually recognized by the NIH as a health disparities population in 2016, which just means that it's a health disparities population that's recognized by the NIH with special funding going toward these. So, so studying these groups is super important, and also there is sort of a focus nationally on doing that and uncovering these health disparities. So you all, it's probably old hat, but just two minutes on definitions. Um, so first we'll talk about biological sex. Um, we act like this is like one really obvious thing, like, oh, it's your biological sex, like there's one definition. And I seem to like always be pregnant, so I joke that every time I have a baby, they assign my child sex purely based on their external genitalia, right? That's the only thing. Nobody's karyotyping these babies. <laughs> Nobody's like sending hormone levels, whatever, whatever. It's all based, their sex assignment at birth is based on what their genitals look like in the delivery room. So when we try to define sex, we try to include all these terms, right? So sex is chromosomes, gonads, hormonal profiles. Um, but this is one of the things we're working toward as we go to, into precision medicine is saying like, well, how did you define sex, right? Like, because recognizing that legal sex is a flawed definition in and of itself. But the important distinction here is that we want to separate sex from gender and then intersex our patients whose biological sex doesn't fit into this binary female male. And that's in contrast to gender, right, which is a sociocultural construct. So I'm doing woman, right, I have a dress on, I have earrings on, I have long hair, et cetera, et cetera. That's my gender expression, gender presentation. But just to notice that, that gender is each person's idea of whether they're feminine, masculine, woman, or man. And important to recognize, particularly for, for those of us, well, for everybody, but this is much more common in adolescent populations, that gender identities are fluid and can change with time. So the gold standard is always going to be to ask a patient, what is not only your gender identity, but what is your current gender identity? So all, everything you see here makes up gender. <coughs> Classically, we'll use female, male when we're referring to the biological piece and woman, man when we're talking about um, gender. So for those of you that are researchers in the room, which is probably everybody, this is my dork slide, just to say that what we were taught was that gender <laughs> is binary, right? It's like male, female, woman, man. But really what it is is much more of a spectrum um, of, of gender expression and in cartoon form. Gender, yeah, of course. Yeah, 
haven't seen that for race. I'll let other people um, answer that if they know. I have seen that for gender. So there are some scales available. There's, a, there's one cardiology paper I can find for you where um, patients that had more like feminine characteristics like had, did worse. I can't remember if the outcome was mortality or whatever, but there's, there's some validated scales, right? And remember that, of course, what we define as femininity and masculinity depends on what culture you're in, what year it is, right? Um, but we ca you can assess sort of like, you know, how feminine or so, you know, someone is. And you've probably seen the gender unicorn, right? Like all of these are scales. Some people are like, you know, hyper feminine or whatever, and, and it goes both ways. But I have seen that. It's harder, um, but there are some scales. And I'll see if I can give me your email afterward and I'll find you a paper. <laughs> Perfect. Oops, I'm sorry. And then this is just an example of some different gender identities that you'll see. So trans and cis, but then we also have gender fluid, gender queer, um, and then two-spirit is a Native American idea, which we use that term, or a lot of people use that term to apply to any sort of like indigenous or cultural identity that's a non-binary gender. So the key, and I'm gonna not say too much about this, because Dr. Samuels is gonna cover this, is that we want you to think of sex and gender as two independent variables, and you ask these as separate questions. So we don't wanna conflate the two because then you're making people invisible when they don't correlate one to one, okay? And everything that I've showed you is pretty much from here. The Sager guidelines are really helpful. Um, these were written for editors, but they're really helpful for um, peer reviewers and for authors as well. Um, and then this National Academy um, report is super helpful as well. So just a couple of tips for utilizing EMR. I do, um, I don't, you, I'm not a health sciences researcher or a big systems person, so I do a lot of EMR. Um, research, and if for those of you, how many of you have Epic? Like everybody has Epic these days, right? A lot of people have Epic, okay. So there, you can utilize um, Epic and this uh, tab called the Soji tab. Um, so this is my Epic, what it looks like. And you can see we've got it programmed so that the patient's gender is what shows up on our tracking board. So if you, this chart is open, but if I just look at the tracking board, this is legal sex and this is gender identity, so what shows up is their gender identity, and we did that on purpose, right, because we don't want to misgender folks. But there's a tab here called SOGI, which stands for Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. If you don't use it often, you have to click on your dot, 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 and go to Rarely Used, and it will be there. Um, and this is where you can change this stuff. So in ours, this is the portion that is like what's on the ID filled out by registration. That's the only thing I can't change is their legal sex, but I can change everything else um, including sexual orientation, anatomy, et cetera. So if I have a conversation with a patient, I go ahead and update all of this um, so that we are treating the patient right, but also so that if the person that comes behind me is less comfortable having this conversation, then they don't have to ask about bottom surgery if I've already put that information in there. Um, and just a note on missingness. So my last retrospective uh, project using EMR data, I, I wanted to use gender and I found that gender was like 90% missing. <laughs> so I had to use sex, because everybody had a legal sex in there and nobody had a gender. And that's a challenge, right? Um, but it, it's key to note, there's some principles for this, how this data is collected, as Maggie alluded to. If you're asking a patient in the middle of a busy waiting room with a registration person they're gonna meet for two minutes, like, what's your gender identity, loudly with a bunch of people around? probably a lot of people aren't gonna be super comfortable disposing, so that's why it's important to know that you can change it once you interact with a patient. Um, but also, this is my chart. So I always tell patients, particularly these adolescent patients, that it, they can log into their own my chart and go through these questions if they'd like to or if they're not comfortable doing it at that time. Um, and I think that's it for me. Uh, please. Yes, please. Yes, but I feel like you are better at that than me since you're PEM. <laughs> yeah, so, so I do DM and PEM, and so particularly for our adolescent um, so generally it's important to know what age the parents have access to the part of your system, um, and it's really easy to see how your EMR is set up, but definitely if you want to have a and this is something that we're going to be able to see that part. And so when we have a conversation with PEM with adolescents, Thank you. Yep. Really important point. 
All right, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about race and ethnicity. So I wanted to just start off with some background and history about when the term race was first used. So in text, it was first dated around the 1500s. And then about 200 years later, you started to see the term ethnicity be, be used in different texts. So the Oxford Dictionary defines race as a group of people sharing a common origin and with distinct facial features or characteristics. While ethnicity is a, defined as a group of people who often have a common national cultural tradition. So it is important, despite these definitions, to remember that race and ethnicity are dynamic, changing over time and dependent on location. For example, someone may be seen as black in America or colored in South Africa, like our popular water singer, Tyler, if you guys are familiar. And also, what was considered white has changed over time. So in the United States, Mexicans were considered white at one time, Italians were not, and North Africans are considered white in some um, census recordings as well. But it's also important to understand that race and ethnicity are social constructs and they're not biologic. So that kind of under, underlines its dynamic nature. So what we do know is that race is complicated and is context and country dependent. And those considered distinct, it's the lines are very blurry. So if we know that it is a social construct, why does it actually matter that we actually study race and ethnicity? So it's because it has major implications in our health outcomes and how patients are treated because people are biased. Everyone has their biases. So we do know that disparities exist in healthcare processes. It affects who's able to access certain treatments, preventative care, as well as follow-up. There have been several studies and antidotes of individuals talking about the treatments that they received, especially minority patients, whether or not their pain was adequately treated, whether they got a bed in the emergency department, if how long it took for them to get sent to the cath lab. So all these have major implications on patient outcomes. So what is even more important is that despite us knowing that bias exists in healthcare, there continues to be a paucity of data available in the collection of race and ethnicity. So in the United States, the disease registries actually have the most accurate data on race and ethnicity. While private healthcare systems, their EHRs are usually less accurate, and oftentimes Asian and Pacific Islanders are most likely to be misclassified across all that databases. These are just a collection of different ones. All right, so where do you find these data? Um, so as I mentioned before, the SOGI, and then we have real functionalities in our EM EMRs. It's really important that these have to be system-based interventions. So systems, so different hospital systems have to actually make this a priority and initiative for them. Because not all of us have EPIC, so what do we do when we don't have EPIC? Or what do we do if we're still using paper charts? So kind of just taking all that into consideration. All right, so when using race and ethnicity from EHRs, it's important to take into consideration the missingness of data, what's actually available, how race and ethnicity change, changes over time, and also based off of individuals. If someone's adopted and they might have taken the 23andMe test, they might change how they later identify. And then also that we have to identify inaccuracies. And then we also have to take into consideration a patient's comfort in sharing this information. So if it's just someone random coming up to them, it's like, hey, how do you identify? They may feel like you are discriminating against them. They might not feel comfortable sharing that information with you. So there's been studies that show that patients are more willing to share that, it's, um, that information with people that they see as their long-term healthcare providers. And then also it's important to remember where is this data actually coming from? Is it coming from someone's perceived definition of what they think that your race is? Or is it self-reporting? So it's really important that we encourage self-reporting during these as well. Thank you so much. That was um, a really wonderful overview. The, uh, the thing that I would add also, because we're going to sort of talk about the systems and structures that these things exist in, is in addition to the implicit and explicit interpersonal biases, we have historically and continue to have broad sweeping policy change. So even if somebody is not experiencing implicit or, in, uh, or interpersonal racism, oftentimes the communities they come from have sort of uh, felt the impact of structural racism. Um, as well, which ch certainly changes their health outcomes. Um, but we've, you've heard us say a couple of times that uh, 
understanding your data is really important. And I will fully disclose at this moment that I am like a data science quantitative nerd, um, despite my eventual progression into mixed methods. Um, so I spend like a lot of time thinking about the data that we use and what happens. And I think what we don't spend enough time is um, thinking about what happens before the data get to us and get to our, either us or our statistician. And so just sort of thinking about this broadly, there are a number of different levels as to where this um, variation, and I say variation um, deliberately because while the goal is to identify inaccuracies, one cannot have an accuracy without like accuracy or inaccuracy without gold standard. So we're just going to talk about variation because that's really the only thing that we can see in a secondary data analysis. Um, so as mentioned, this can happen over time due to somebody's um, progression of their self-identity or comfort in the setting that they're being asked. But also we know that at the institutional level, there are all sorts of data rules about how things get rolled up such that it can be used. And those actually vary from institution to institution. They also vary at the state level. So um, for a number of different reasons, when they get reported to the state, they're, con they're subject to a number of other data rules at that point where things can be combined or disaggregated again. An error can be introduced at that moment. Um, but also the state and federal guidelines often mandate very specific uh, things to where, so it's very lo uh, locally specific. Um, so there are a number of different places where inaccuracy can be introduced. And as a result, this changes the data that you see, and in terms of like the moments where you can lose specificity, um, have variation, and the decisions that you need to make with the data when you see that variation over time. Um, but it also report, uh, impacts the data that we use because this gets fed up to the national um, and state levels, and then we get sort of estimates of disparities back, and then we make decisions about that. And it has a number of different, as previously mentioned, I won't belabor this point, but this, this matters, right, for, for a number of different reasons beyond just us wanting our research to be robust, decisions are being made on this, and oftentimes the people making these decisions are not researchers. Uh, they are policy makers or things like that, and like, who, who frankly don't have the time or investment in caring about these sorts of inaccuracies. Um, so just to sort of think about the categories we use. So in general, the Office of Management and Budget, who sets the guidelines for the census, is usually what people defer to. The AAMC guidelines, for example, define underrepresented in medicine based on the OMB guidelines. And so one cannot be over underrepresented in medicine unless the OMB counts you, um, which has changes over time. Uh, and then the guidelines also set, or the states also set minimum standards as well. So just to sort of talk about the federal guidelines, up until very recently, uh, there have been um, five racial categories and one ethnicity category that are now being rolled um, into one race ethnicity category with the addition of Middle Eastern and North Africa, um, North African. As was previously alluded to before this, they were considered in the white category. Um, and I want to acknowledge here that there is a tension and discussion around this conversation around Hispanic and Latino as a race versus ethnicity, um, even in the, like, the community and people's reporting um, within the Hispanic and Latino communities. And so that's not exactly straightforward, but this is the guideline that we've been given. So it's worth knowing those things. Um, at present, just to touch on um, sexual orientation, uh, well, gender identity, uh, only sex is collected in federal census data, and there are only five federal surveys that include gender identity. All of the other 20 some odd ones only use sex. And so this leads to a lot of variation because these are floors and not ceilings. Um, recent data outside of like looking at Medicaid applications from state to state shows that race categories can range from five, which is previously the minimum, to 56, with a median of 13. Ethnicity from two to 37, with a median of six. Um, so we happen, um, Maggie and I, and Onyeke happen to work in a state that mandates 36 different um, ethnicity slash country of origin documents, and also mandates that this data get collected at every acute, op acute care visit. So every emergency department uh, visit, every ob stay, every inpatient stay, it's mandated. 
but all of our guidelines are based on the outpatient setting. Um, even the, um, and when thinking about um, gender identity, um, in 2023, CMS included three optional gender identity questions that states can elect to add to their application. And even the federal surveys that have chosen to include this don't necessarily mandate it. So the BRFSS um, of the 32 states that are enrolled in it, 17 or so um, do not collect gender identity. And just to sort of highlight this, again, it's, I, I am happy to provide this resource for whatever reason, it didn't make it onto the slide, but it's this from an anthropology uh, paper that talks about the idea of racial identity is constructed and reconstructed in the presence of others. Um, and it's very much a you think, therefore I am sort of thing, but it is something that we integrate into our own personal identities. Um, and so because the data are identified, uh, the data are necessary to identify and address disparities in communities. We have talked a lot about why this is important, but to illustrate um, why, how there is like sort of another side to this coin, we have to consider the dangers potentially to the patient. So, for example, there are the five states that have the red shield. It is a federal offense to provide standard of care to transgender youth or felony, excuse me, not federal offense, it's a felony. Um, and so when we ask those questions, we put our patients at risk, and oftentimes we put ourselves at risk. And so we need to know how to ask these, why to ask these, in what context to ask these, and how to do it safely for our patients. And so when the question sort of becomes, I've told you all of these problems, right? But we all go back to our shops and somebody hands us like a data set of like 2,000 people and now what do I do, right? Um, and the, really what happens is if you understand the rules at your institution, you at least understand your limitations. So when you see bizarre trends, you sort of know, oh, I know where this came from. It's because our institution chooses to backlog Brazilian people who have identified as Hispanic or Latino as no, and so there is an error rate here that I can't quite justify. So that knowledge will end up serving you contextually, but it also helps you sort of decide on sensitivity analyses and consider the categories in which you use to reflect whatever processes you may be um, intending to. So very often there is a discussion around we include race in various statistical models as a measure of racism, and as our data become more robust, it's worth thinking about potential alternatives depending on the question you're asking. And then, of course, gold standard, um, ask the patient, primary data collection, which I very thankfully don't do very often because it's hard, and I'm gonna hand it over to Liz. <laughs> So this section is called best practices for data collection reporting, but I want to say these are not the best ever, right? This is like a progressive work in progress, and I, I think as we'll kind of go over, um, uh, you know, these are stagnant artificial categories to try to reflect a human experience, which is like very complex and dynamic and changing. So um, I, th I think it's very important to keep that in mind. and stay flexible and humble our, ourselves as we're trying to collect data collection, trying to do data collection in primary research. And I'm gonna repeat a little bit about what we talked about before. Um, I, I touch a little bit about what everyone's already covered, but try to consolidate it into some recommendations for as you go forward in doing primary data collection. So data collection is extremely important for health equity, right? It's essential to identify inequities and disparities in care, set priorities, and for resource allocation and where you're going to address and try to eliminate health inequities and measure progress in addressing those inequities. And equity-focused data collection um, generates data that are accurate or as accurate as possible or strives towards accuracy, are reliable, and affirms patients' identities and experiences. So I'm just gonna go through um, kind of some basic concepts to guide and then we'll go through specific recommendations. So <clears throat> core components of a health equity approach to data collection uh, focuses on accurate, non-stigmatizing data collection, 
tries to understand the relationship between health inequities and structural determinants of health, uses person-first language, accounts for intersectionality, and engages the communities being described, um, engaged, or studied. So this is extremely important when you're, getting, when you're building a new primary data collection instrument and you're going to collect data from a stigmatized or marginalized community. Getting feedback about how your questions are asked and whether they're understandable um, is extremely important and whether they're relevant. Um, so the recommendations I'm gonna go through today I drew from a variety of different sources. These are some of them. Um, so there are some from private foundations, or some from um, Institute of Medicine, um, some insurers have recommendations, some other health services researchers, and I have uh, references for these at the, at the end. So the first thing to consider when you're setting up data collection is what data do you need to collect? What data will best suit your needs? Who are you trying to reach? What is data is essential? And this is a balance of what's be nice to have and what do you need to have? What decisions will the data inform? Will the data be pertinent and actionable, or is it just data you happen to be collecting? And who is going to review and utilize the data? <clears throat> Privacy and confidentiality are key considerations. Is the data personally identifiable? So if you're working in a population and you're collecting a specific identity, but like only a handful of people have that identity, are you placing those people at risk of being identified when you publish your, funding, your studies, even though they're de-identified? But in aggregate, there's four people in your sample. That's a problem, right? Um, is the information sensitive? Who has access? Regulation considerations, obviously. How are you going to securely store the data? Do you, how long are you going to hold the data? And what, what kind of uh, plan do you have for destroying your data? And then in terms of demographic questions, where you place them in your conduction of your maybe interview or survey, if you do it at the end, right, this may limit some of your response bias um, for your earlier questions. Maybe you care more about the content of the survey. Um, people do get survey fatigue at the end of questionnaires, so you may have lower responses of those demographic questions at the end. But maybe you decide it's more important to me to understand their perspective on like the meat of the survey questions, and I'm willing to, to take that. But if the demographic data, this is really, um, that's really central to the question you're asking, um, putting them, and, or it's determining eligibility for your study, you might put those questions at the beginning. So these are just some decisions to make when you're making your survey instruments. And then all of, always when you make a survey, you're always kind of striking this balance between length and data needs for your analysis. So every question should have a purpose. They should include information about consent and confidentiality. People should know what's gonna happen to their data. Um, how it's going to be stored, how long it's going to be kept, and how it's going to be used. Self-identification is preferred. So people being able to answer the questions themselves um, is much preferable to, obviously, I and mean, I think we've all, maybe not all, but I think I have worked in, um, this is not for primary data collection, but in the hospital, where registrars are just kind of checking off what identity they think people are. Not accurate. Um, but in first primary data collection, we should never be doing that. You need to consider the need for granularity, answer options in order. Sometimes the order in which your answer responses are in can um, reinforce hierarchies or stigmatization in, in the, how the questions are, our responses are what, arranged. Um, and then <clears throat> demographic data collection categories should be collected separately. And I'll go through some of those. Um, in terms of purpose of the questions, some questions may be sensitive, and you should be aware of this when you're um, making your data collection instruments. People may want to know how the data is going to be used, how the research is going to benefit them, how you're going to protect their information. Um, and so, you, and you can explain those things. Being transparent um, is, is, the, is the best approach. For answer options in order, provide multi-select checkboxes where possible. Yes, this is challenging with data cleaning and preparation, but people don't fit in just one box. This is really important. Um, Open-ended Options um, should be included in every question in case they do not fit into any of these categories. Including a prefer not to answer option um, is also very important. And then as I mentioned, you know, the order of response choices may re in reinforce implicit bias. So um, placing United States on the top of a nation of origin question, for example, as opposed to them being in alphabetical order. That's just like, that's just one example. Um, so the, qu the example on the slide here is about employment status. Um, so you may, th this is from the harm, um, NIDA's harm reduction network, pulled together a consortium of community-based harm reduction organizations who work with 
um, people who use drugs and um, largely people um, experiencing homelessness to come up with a, and some of the questions I've pulled are from that harm, harm reduction research network. So this is one of their employment status questions which provides a large variety of options but it has an example of a fill in the blank and then a none of the above um, and a prefer not to answer option. As we've talked about, race and ethnicity are social constructs and they are often, we're, we're collecting those information for proxies for racism and bias based off of ethnicity, right? When we're trying to look at health inequities. But being able um, to collect these are really important. Um, recognizing that that categories have changed over time, as, as Rama already talked about, um, and variable and nuance and detail. So these are really best to obtain by self-report. Um, you need to allow for more than one answer option, allowing people to skip or prefer not to answer, again, really important. Um, and then another, another option with the ability to specify if their identity is not listed. Um, and one thing that is really important that you'll have to think about is if you're making a novel instrument that is trying to be very inclusive of a wide range of identities, that does not always harmonize with existing administrative data sets, which are much more limited. So you'll need to do some thinking about how you're going to harmonize maybe your comprehensive, tailored, inclusive <laughs> approach with these more like administrative limited data sets and have a logic to explain of like why you do that. Um, you just need to be able to prepare to do that. If you're going to do some kind of mixed methods research combining your primary data collection with large administrative data sets. Um, so this is just another, this is another example from the harm reduction research network about um, race. They actually do a multi-step racial one which I'll talk about a little bit. So here's a couple of examples. Institute of Medicine released a report which gave some examples um, about race and ethnicity um, that's more broad and then um, more granular. Um, and I, I have some more options on the next slide. So th they have just a very a binary one, whether you're Hispanic or Latino or not, um, the kind of um, prior census categories, and then they have um, a more, they recommend a more granular ethnicity question. I don't know if you can see this option, but maybe you can see on this PDF slide on the app, but um, these are a couple of different examples for multi-select lists for race and ethnicity. The for example one um, has the 2024 um, census examples that um, Rama showed, um, but then they also have um, an open-ended um, a combination multi-select with open-ended question option, um, and then <coughs> a more open-ended ones with um, open text description for each racial identity. And then for ethnicity, some of this, I think, you, you can tailor based off of where you are. So um, having a very long list, like all of the ethnicities, might not be tenable for um, at least survey fatigue for individuals, but if you know a general composition of ethnicities in your area, you may do a shorter list with op fill-in options. Um, for example, so the one on the left is from the Harm Reduction Network, um, and one on the, the one on the right is another example that provides some additional examples, not only of race, but also um, breaks out um, different, um, different um, ethnicities if for, for Latin American countries, Caribbean countries. And then, you know, Asian American Pacific Islander is like half of the world, um, which is like a gigantic bucket and makes no sense um, to me. But so this one kind of breaks it down more granularly um, to reflect uh, people's identities a little bit better in addition to having an open fill-in option. Um, language spoken. So these are again Institute of Medicine recommendations. Um, this may or may not be relevant to your research but can be very helpful and important I think. Um, so they focus more on um, English proficiency and like measuring that proficiency and then uh, primary language or preferred language spoken um, which can be helpful if you're maybe you're trying to figure out what languages you need to make your study instruments in or something like that. Um, this could be helpful for some like needs assessments. Um, sex and gender, we already talked about gender being a social construct. You know, a lot of the research I do, I actually don't need biologic sex. That's not something I care about. I care more about gender. Um, some studies, like I do need sex. So either it's required by the NIH that I collect biologic sex data, or maybe we're doing a clinical trial and there's a medication involved and like, knowing some of the involvements of hormones is actually helpful. Um, so you may collect both biologic sex and gender. 
Um, but you can also just collect gender if that is the thing you're really interested in studying. Um, similar kind of principles, people self-identify, allowing for flexibility, um, they can update their gender identity later, and this is, these are two examples of a two-step question. Um, so um, the one on the right um, just asks, what's your gender? And the person can identify what their gender, and the follow-up question is, do you identify as trans? So that does not include um, biologic sex. Um, and then um, there's another example of a kind of three-step question, which includes pronouns on the left. Um, and then these are a couple examples for asking about sexual orientation. Again, allowing fill-in options, allowing options for people to decline to answer and self-report. Other important areas for data collection are, are disability, nation of origin, and religion. Um, but these need to be pertinent and needed um, when you're collecting them. Again, using person-first, non-stigmatizing language, really important for identifying and mitigating inequities, um, but need to be cautious about um, uh, causing re-stigmatization or marginalization and keeping information confidential. Um, and then, particularly for nation of origin and religion, depending on the community, engagement and transparency with your study population is key. So um, we did a study, a, an administrative database study in Minneapolis. We wanted to see if there were changes in um, healthcare utilization from people who were from countries who were targeted by the Muslim ban. And we found a health system that collected nation of origin data on all of their patients. And I was like, this is perfect for me, the researcher, to be able to go see was there an impact in healthcare utilization and like health concerns amongst this targeted population um, through this like policy. We did see a difference, which is someone expected but terrible. But also, like we w most health systems, you can't do that kind of data. And also, there is like a real concern among stigmatized communities. Are you creating a registry of people for being targeted and stigmatized against in the future? So there, there are these really careful balances around like, Confidentiality, how is the data used? Are we using it to measure health inequities? Or, or are we, is it, could it be used to re-stigmatize and target a community? So you know, I, I do think that engagement is, is really important um, in, un, in understanding that. So one thing I do want to say is you know, we are trying to improve something that is limited and is often not perfect and is a work in progress. And we need to approach it as such and really just get our ego out of it, be willing to take accountability, learn, develop new ways to collect data that's more relevant, um, and really getting to the heart of like why we're collecting those data. Um, not everything you plan like works out. <laughs> you can do a really good job setting up your data collection instrument, um, even reviewing it with people, and then when you actually roll the instrument out, participants might say, I have no idea what you're trying to ask me. In which case, you need to be flexible, be able to adapt and maybe change what you're trying to do if you're like, this isn't really, uh, this isn't really being received that well. Just be genuine, be flexible. Um, we're all, I think, just trying to come at this with like a beginner's mind and like an approach of, of being humble, I think is, is the way to do it. And um, hopefully we'll get to a place where we, we actually do have best practices. These are some of the resources that um, I have. Um, your, um, and uh, this is on the app, I believe. So, but these were all, I think, really helpful, provide nice um, summaries about um, approaching data collection, both in EHRs and in primary data collection. And then I think with that, we're ready to take questions, right? Thank you. <laughs>